way and elevates a particular way of being useful in a way that um, elders don't necessarily appreciate because they think it means replacing them and getting them to move out of the way. When I know that truthfully, having worked with young people for over a decade directly on the front lines of public health campaigns to move policies and environmental and systems changes to improve the health of entire communities, that young people very much want to be in partnership, that what's going on in terms of how youth are portrayed in the media is wanting to take over and not listen and not be in partnership, to not be under tutelage of folks who have been um, down the road ahead of them, that, um, that that's all really a lie, that that is propaganda that helps keep um, generations from working uh, more closely together. And so what I've seen on the front lines of community work with young people is that they very much want to be in partnership. They want to learn from um, older folks who have um, done more work and had more experience. They are hungry kinds of relationships. They are, they are hungry to be seen as who they really are um, by the, the adults and elders in their community. And so I truly believe that successful activism is going to have to require this, if not just for the fact that young people are going to inherit um, as adults, the fruits of the labor um, of our current day movement, but also because it creates an expectation for those young people about what they need to do as they get um, older in years to pull up the ranks behind them, to constantly have a sense of um, passing down and continuity in the movement so that we can have really good forward motion in the work that we do in communities. And so that's part of the day-to-day -day experience I was blessed to have for, for many, many years when I worked um, with young people. And that hasn't been too long that I've transitioned from direct work with young people, but I continue to be a deep supporter of that work just from a different position at this point. And for folks that um, don't know about uh, you, Idell, um, let, let folks know how you got involved in activism yourself. Because like I said, I've always known you to be somewhat of an activist. You're in a different role now because uh, you're working with yeah. Um, no problem. Uh, well, you know, as it is, as is, as is the case for most young people, I had um, a broader awakening to activism work when I was in college and um, wanted to do something about the fact that so few Latinos um, were attending the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. So I matriculated to the university in 1998 and uh, noticed that there were not um, specialized recruitment programs to help um, Latino and Latina students um, to come to the university. Um, there are some traditions about how <laughs> folks from the Latinx communities raise their children, and going away to college is not necessarily, um, going away away from the home is not necessarily a part of the more traditional sort of um, culture um, of our families. And so we, we had to think of ways of strategies to really um, rope in the parents and to get them to see the Carolina campus as a part of their family. We had to do that. We had to ameliorate the family as a whole and not just court the student. So while I was there, helped to create a program that would successfully recruit Latinx students and um, eventually was hired by Student Affairs and the um, Office of uh, Multicultural Affairs to um, implement this program. And to this day, that position still exists. Um, uh, after it was created in about 2000, so it's still existing. And I want to say that their enrollment has increased by over three or 400 percent since then. And so that was the beginning of my journey of thinking about cross sectors, cross departments, and um, leveraging the resources of an institution and working with the students on campus um, and the cultural organizations to help implement a program like that with the support of lots of different people and the blessing of the administration uh, that lives on to this day afterwards transitioned to doing uh, voting rights work for formerly incarcerated individuals um, at the ACLU um, during uh, the Help America Vote Act uh, season after the Bush election uh, where he was elected by a court of law. And so got to learn a little bit more about how the voting system works and how um, information needed to be put out there. And in effect, learned even deeper how systems disenfranchise its citizens uh, and work to bring awareness um, across different organizations to getting sure, make, getting to make sure that folks did not lose their right to vote. And then transitioned from that work into um, 
doing public health work, which was quite unexpected for me, um, and learned about the social justice aspect of public health work. In fact, public health is underneath the umbrella of social justice, if I might be so bold, and worked there on a wonderful campaign, primarily at the beginning on teen tobacco prevention, uh, highlighting the exploitation of the tobacco industry to target young people, especially young people of color in low-income communities, to use products that could eventually end in their death. And so worked by hiring high school students from the Durham area at first, and then moved over into hiring students from Raleigh, North Carolina as well. Um, but we had multiple offices across the state and grew our work from not just working in partnership with young people to build these campaigns across the state with the support of young people at the forefront um, on teen tobacco prevention, but also underage drinking prevention, substance abuse prevention, um, access to health care, oral health care, and obesity prevention. So, you know, all the easy things. <laughs> but young people were up to the challenge, and that was quite beautiful. And, you know, whenever we lost our bravery, um, they were often there to inspire us. And so we needed each other in that work because it is very daunting to go up against very complicated systems with huge, huge moneyed lobbies um, that are always lobbying and have many resources at every turn to um, convince our government to not do what is in the best interest of the people. Yeah, definitely. Um, you raised up a couple of different interesting things doing this. I can't hear you right now. Can you repeat your question? I said, I said that you've raised a couple of interesting things just based on learning the history and everything that some of our listeners may be interested in, know it about, and I'm going to throw them out there, not necessarily in any sense of a order of what I'm thinking about. But one of the things sure. that you talked about, you one of the things that you talked about UNC, and like I said, we had uh, Loan on earlier who did the thing with the uh, Confederate uh, statue, and I was wondering mm-hmm. what your own personal thoughts were with uh, the. Uh, Sam, because Sam is one of those statues that yes. you're talking about taken down in UNC. So I want to know what some yes. of your own personal thoughts were about what's going on and what should go on and whether that needs to come yes. down and some of your own um, personal thoughts are, about it. Well, well, my personal thoughts are is that it should never have been erected in the first place and it should have been brought, up, brought down a long time ago. Um, one of the positions I held through my history that I omitted to mention is at one point I did serve as the assistant director of the Campus Y, and the Campus Y is no longer affiliated with the YM or YWCA. It's actually a freestanding organization that is part of the campus that works on social justice issues, and it's an incubator for social justice projects. Inevitably, many students that come through those walls um, have worked on campaigns to end the promotion, the false promotion of white supremacists on UNC's campus as heroes to the university. And so whether it is the renaming of various halls or the renaming of particular institutions within the campus um, or even to remove the statue, um, they fought many times to either bring more events or speakers or um, monuments to the real heroes of our history, um, as well as also um, rectifying the inaccurate telling of history on campus with these folks, whether they were KKK wizards or others, um, to remove um, those names and sort of uh, monuments to these folks when we know that that story is not being told accurately. Um, One of the things I've always thought was very ironic, there's a wonderful poet by the name of C.J. Sweet that brings this up, um, where he talks about um, Chapel Hill as a town that um, we know sort of – sort of in, like, discussions on the street, pedestrian conversations as a very uh, liberal community. But for those who are from Chapel Hill or live in Chapel Hill as something other than students, they're all too aware of the fact that racism runs just as deeply in Chapel Hill as in any other part of the state of North Carolina. And so um, there is a poem that he does about uh, his town, and I don't remember the name of it, so I hope he'll forg- CJ will forgive me, but one of the things he mentions in that poem is how there's a monument supposedly to the unsung heroes of Chapel Hill, uh, very close to the statue of Silent Sam, and he mentions in this poem, that, well, the statue that's built in um, memoriam to the unsung heroes, to the slaves that built the university, is a table with four little stools around it, and there are many, many bodies that are carved into the statue that lift this table up. Um, and, you know, 
at first blush, this might seem like a great gesture, but in his poem, he talks about how one day he happened upon this memorial to the unsung heroes and saw a white family eating lunch on top of this table. And perhaps maybe that uh, was not thought out so well by the students who um, put together the monies for that particular uh, uh, marker on campus. And so I just, um, I beg for more analysis on the part of university officials um, to think uh, about, you no, know, to really just go ahead and decide to bring, bring this statue down. So those are, those are my personal opinions. I never liked the fact that the statue was there. Um, none of the students I know really did. Um, and it's not lost on me that all the statues are near courthouses and facing north, as if to say that we're, re we're still ready for battle. And so that signifier every day as a person of color didn't exactly comfort me, um, knowing that slaves built the university were uncompensated, have unmarked graves, and, you know, where curriculum still often leaves so much out about folks who really uh, built this country. And that's one of the other things I was going to ask you, Shane, like I said, this conversation may go a little bit around to, to a variety of topics, but just still dealing with activism. Um, when you were a student, I'm sure that um, – there was some conversation about some of those people who were being protected by the DREAM Act and things of that nature because a lot of times those are folks that are involved in um, young families. So there are a lot of times there might be people that are of college age or of high school age, and we know that right now Trump is threatening to pretty much end that program, which means that a lot of folks that are of um, Latin or Latino descent are going to be facing kind of uh, whatever those consequences might be. So I was wondering what you're hearing in the street about what's going on in terms of this possible repeal of the DREAM Act and things of that nature. Yeah, my heart really goes out for students who are facing this time at a time when North Carolina could really use all of the emerging talent and dedicated citizens that it can, um, you know, in our aging, you know, population and in uh, a variety of industry sectors that need, you know, fresh new talent that are ready to be part of the fabric of North Carolina um, it really hurts my heart to see the administration considering doing something that could distract these students from pursuing their dreams to not just better their own lives, but to contribute to the state and to the country. And so it just, it just seems so short-sighted, um, given that this is a time when students should be able to continue investing in their own personal and professional development. Um, and, you know, you know, borders are an interesting thing, you know, borders and, uh, uh, you know, Citizenship, uh, those are such complicated concepts for me as a child of immigrant parents, knowing that so often um, immigrants know the laws and have a sense of country that is um, different from people who have taken it for granted. I'm not going to say it's better. I'll, I'll say that it's keener <laughs> because I assure you that if anyone had to retake a citizenship test, well, not retake, but if any, you know, natural-born citizens had to take a test that my parents took, they probably wouldn't pass. And, um, you know, we'll, we, would, we would have some interesting dynamics if people actually had to do the things that other immigrants have to do in order to be members of this country. So you're saying that if people had to take that actual citizenship test that are natural-born I think born a lot of people's citizenship would be revoked if they uh, were asked to do the same things that other people had to do um, to be part of this country, whether it was the lawyer's fees, whether it was the visits to your consulate, whether it was the tests you had to take, the medical exams you have to participate in. I mean, there are so many hoops, and I think that people are very um, unaware of exactly what the process is in order to come to this country through the ways that have been listed. Um, and so I, I just think people are very in the dark about what it means to become a citizen or to come here, quote, unquote, legally. Um, and all of that, all of that is hidden, I think, from the average American citizen to make them think, oh, you know, it's, it's really easy. Why don't you just do it the, oh, the legal way is the way they throw it out there. But sometimes the legal way is we're talking about two decades and thousands of dollars that people may not have. Um, or time that they may not have because they're escaping civil war, they're escaping gangs, um, they're escaping all kinds of conditions that are, quite frankly, often created by the U.S. Um, as, a, as a country next door sometimes, whether it's our country's demand for drugs or our country's demand for low-cost food and our um, 
way of bankrupting industries in other people's countries with um, trade agreements that don't benefit the countries that these uh, folks are immigrating from. So I think there's a lot of dynamics, and we and we kind of vacuum seal ourselves off, and we, um, you know, we don't offer a lot of mercy or compassion for the consequences of our own consumers.